um, thanks everybody for joining this afternoon and um, extra kudos to Eric. We didn't really calculate in the time change. It was already early and now it's incredibly early. I think it's like 5 a.m. Um, Mountain Standard Time where, where Eric coming from. So uh, big appreciation, everybody. Uh, I'll talk for a little while so Eric can wake up while we get started. Um, but so we this is the first of our couple lectures, um, seminars on the neo-domestication theme. And so we've got a collection of um, speakers talking about uh, basically bringing new species into an agriculture system. And so domestication happened 1,000, 10,000 years ago um, with the original farmers basically selecting crops and selecting traits in those species that made them more amendable to um, basically agriculture, right? The, the, the husbandry of man. And so uh, what, we're, what we're talking about now is neo-domestication or new domestication of new species that traditionally have just been wild, have not been produced for food, uh, for agriculture. And so um, I'm really excited to kick this thing off with, with, with um, uh, Dr. Eric Jackson, uh, who you'll see from this work today has actually, um, led the successful domestication of a wild oat species which I think is, is one of the few, maybe the only really um, hallmark um, demonstrations of how this is, this neo-domestication has really been done. Um, so I'm pleased to have Eric. We, Eric's a good friend. It goes back many, many years now. Uh, we started a long time ago working on oat and making, you know, some of the first um, next generation sequencing genetic maps for oat. And so um, I don't even know where Eric went to school, but he started a career in uh, the USDA, the um, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, which is a federal research agency. And uh, started there working on, on oats, among other things. And then actually moved to an industry position uh, with General Mills, where he continued working on oat, among other things, including wheat, and some other crops. And, and then uh, more recently has actually established and started his own company, 25.2, that I think Eric will tell us some about today. And so throughout all of this, it's spanning, I think more than a decade, maybe close to two decades now, working on this, this uh, wild oat species. And, and now it's a domesticated. So uh, I'm really excited to hear about this and just also to, to impress upon the, you know, the students and everyone else that, that these, these projects and, and, and this thing takes a lot of resilience and a lot of um, time. And so also just to highlight, uh, you know, I hope everyone will stay around for the, the journal club and the discussion afterwards, but also to highlight with Eric, having, you know, worked in a government research agency, a really large industry, and then working on his own um, startup private company as a really great perspective of the whole gamut um, across the research uh, space to, so you can have a really great idea. Um, you know, just asking him what it's like to work in different settings and do research in these ways. So like I said, Eric's got um, just really, really good example of how this neo-domestication has actually been done. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric and we really look forward to hearing your um, talk today. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. And so I do just super appreciate it, Jesse. I think um, we published the first paper just this year um, on this crop. So I guess it's been a hidden, I'd like to say it's been hidden, kind of like kind of like the way I like to do work. But but yeah, so I'm pretty excited. Um, this would be probably one of the few times that I've shared the whole story, um, specifically in a kind of a university setting. So I'm pretty excited about that. But what I thought I would do initially, as Jesse pointed out, and, and I appreciate that, I spent um, part of my career in academia and then in the government and then in large industry, like Jesse said, and then now in my own endeavor, um, you know, with a, with a large group of people. And, and just, I know as Jesse will tell you all the way through my path is since, you know, the time that, that we've gotten to know each other, I've always reached back out to Jesse. So super appreciate, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also excited that, you know, Jesse's over there with you guys now and, and, and hopefully I look forward to doing some work with him on some other stuff. Um, 
But what I really wanted to do today was kind of like, you know, throw everybody a curveball. So yeah, my first slide is not a classic slide that would say, you know, here's who I am and this is what my talk title is going to be. I'll get to that probably about 12 slides into the presentation. Um, and I just wanted to throw everybody off with just the first slide of just like made in space, right? And so everybody's like, what? You know, like, why, what are we talking about? Neo, neo domestication in space is that we're talking about. And, and that's not it. What I really wanted to do is give you kind of a background of where I am today and then, and then kind of interweave kind of how I got where I am through this whole process. And, and I would argue that, you know, when you, when you think about, you know, the, the domestication of the Vena Magna, it's just, it's, it's kind of wound into the fabric of who I am. It started whenever I started my job right after uh, my first job, right after graduate school. Um, where this oat, this wild oat species was brought to me by one of my mentors, Rick Jellin, who's uh, the head of the Department of Life Sciences at Brigham Young University, just down the road from where I'm at in Southeast Idaho. So yeah, a little, a little bit early, so hopefully I'll, I'll be as energetic as I normally am when I'm talking about stuff like this. So it's a little bit also weird. Wish I was there with you in person. Uh, that'd be a lot more fun, so I could hang out with Jesse and his family, um, and then you guys as well, but, uh, but hey, I'll, I'll do my best job in the virtual world. But, um, so why made in space? And so um, whenever I was working with General Mills, um, I was sent out to a think tank on the on the west on the west coast in Silicon Valley, um, and uh, I was kind of the beneficiary of the fact that the that the CTO of the company um, wasn't able to attend that that meeting, and so they said, "Hey, who's our who's our likely most next guy to go out and sit through this process?" And so they they picked me and. So that whole process of being in that think tank um, was around feeding feeding people around the world, right? Doing something about global food security. And so uh, I was really bored um, with the conversation. It was really centered around if you want to help a billion people, you know, if you want to make a billion dollars, figure out a way to help a billion people. And that's not really where I was. I'm kind of more the impression that, hey, why don't you just try to help a billion people and who cares how much money you make? So I guess I really wasn't a corporate guy. I never got transferred over. But the one person that I met whenever um, I was there was a guy named Jason Dunn. He was one of four people that founded the company Made in Space. Um, the, the company Made in Space has since been acquired. Um, I don't know if you guys have been aware or seen, and maybe even your institution is involved in the the uh, the new uh, the reef like low Earth or Earth orbit like um, commercial space station. Um, but on that kind of like infograph or infomercial that they do for that, you'll see the, the, the main space printers. Um, and so what they did and what Jason said and what made me enamored by him was really this idea that um, they were four interns working at NASA um, whenever they were working with the, the space shuttle program. And once um, the director of NASA came right towards the end, and they were really passionate about about doing something to get people to um, to go back to the moon and beyond. They were always troubled by the fact that if you ask the astronauts back in the late 1960s, where they thought we'd be in the year 2020 or 2010, where, where do you think we'd be? They'd be shocked if they heard we'd never even gone back to the moon. And so they were sitting around thinking about this. The director of NASA came and he said, hey, we're going to terminate the space shuttle program. And so they were all four stuck with this thing of like, hey, we're rocket scientists. What are we going to do now? This is our dream. So they were sitting in a room and, and Jason Dunn, one of the four founders of this, said, they were all talking about what do we want to do commercially now? And, and one of the guys, Mike Snyder, who's the personality of the founders, he just, I always like to say now when I talk to him, I dare to ask the question of the group, what if we didn't need a rocket? Um, and so that was really fascinating to the rest of the group. They're like, what, Mike? What do you mean? And he said, what if we didn't need a rocket? Everything that's wrong with space today is the fact that it costs $10,000 a pound to send anything into orbit um, and beyond. And so, so what if we just didn't need a rocket? So what if we think of it that way? And, and Jason Dunn always used to tell me, he said, Eric, he said, that is probably the most obscene question you can ask a rocket scientist. What if we didn't need a rocket? Like, um, and he said, and that's what founded their organization. So he challenged me to think about if you ever do anything else in your life, you know, any, anything you take the knowledge that you've gained and go to the next level, you should try to ask really, um, really challenging or different questions or disruptive questions within your field. And so, so that's really where I keyed in. And one, one of the things that, that Jason said off of that, he said, Eric, if you do this, you really need to start with doing meaningful work. And so, and then the next thing you need to do is after you 
do meaningful work is then really innovate disruptively. Take all the disruptive technologies in the world, integrate those into the meaningful work that you're trying to do. It's centered around asking very disruptive questions. And then the third thing is, is just remember, start small and go big. Don't, don't do it the opposite, right? And that completed the triangle and foundation of where, where they went and what they started after they sat around this room. And a mere like six years after they started, they were the first people to put the 3D printer on the space station. Um, and so it's really pretty powerful. It didn't start out as a glamorous thing. It started out really hard, really, really ugly, which most innovation does, a lot of failure. Um, I think they brought in almost every 3D printer from around the world and to see if it would work in zero gravity or low, low gravity. And then they, they took it all apart and they figured out how to make one that would work. Um, and that was just a lot of work. Um, and so this is a picture of, of Jason. He's at the top smiling back. Um, and that's their very first printer that they were using on what they call the vomit comet or the parabolic plane flights before they set it up to the, to the space station. And so with all that wrapped around and, and everything that I'm gonna tell you about today, um, with the neodomestication of the Avena magna species, um, just in, in, my, in, in my career. Um, once I was with General Mills and had that to the very end, then I was thinking of all the things I learned and what do I want to do and what would it allow me to do in, in, in terms of what Jason was talking about, doing something very, very cool. And when I, when I met Jason, when I heard Jason, I, you know, we're in this room of all these people, this think tank, there's a lot of big name people in this group. And I remember raising my hand at the back of the room and I said, you know, congratulations, Jason, on a wing bending moment. And everybody in the room looked at me like, what? Wing bending moment? What does that mean? And Jason just looked at me and said, thanks, Eric. He said, why don't you hang out with me the rest of the day? And so this is where I, I just got the opportunity to do this and, and to hear, hear his story and build a friendship that's, that's spanned beyond that. Um, but what I meant was, is what I viewed as them doing putting additive manufacturing, 3D printing on the space station was like the Wright brothers figuring out how to bend the wing and control three-dimensional movement through air, right? It wasn't the win-all, but it was such a transformational moment when you move into to this issue about what if we didn't need a rocket? Because now you eliminate all the things that rockets can confine us to when you talk about doing things in space that we've never been able to do before. And so, and that's, that's really the essence of when you do new things, when we talk about what we're talking about, neo-domestication, bringing crops to bear on the planet that have never been there before. Those are like wing bending moments. Like think about that. It doesn't have to look pretty. It's not glamorous. It's not big, but it's the stepping stone to get other people to, to lean on that work, to understand what you did in that work and then take it to the next level. It's like, it's like when you think about, um, standing on the shoulders of giants before you, right? It's, it's always the way education should work. Somebody takes it so far and then and somebody else can learn from them, grow from them and take it to the next level. So whenever, you know, we think about 25.2 and what 25.2 stands for, the quintessential thing that I leaned off of that for Mike and everybody else is to ask a really disruptive or really kind of obscene question in your field. And that question for us is, what if anyone in the world could develop their own crop varieties? So, and I know I've talked to breeders about this, everybody listens to this, they say, what? <laughs> like, wait a minute, you're gonna start a seed, a breeding company, and you're asked the question, what if we didn't, what if anyone in the world could create their own crop varieties? Um, and so what does that look like? And so when we think about that, and I kind of put myself on that triangle, because we really hold to those, those three principal concepts in this new endeavor, I look at that and say, what meaningful work are we doing, right, off of this work that I'm gonna talk about today? And we're doing meaningful work because we're working with small, subsistent farmers in Morocco, in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and now Nicaragua. And we're expanding that with this idea that what if any scientist in those countries or anywhere, or, or even any agrarian farmer, any, any person could have the tools to where they can work on their needs with their problems right there in their home? What if they could develop their own crops for their needs? Um, and then we do that through machine learning, genomics, and artificial intelligence in a way that can be democratized to those areas. So the focus is not creating tool sets and all of these things that we can do in these big labs with expensive equipment, but how can we democratize that into these villages, into these places where, where anybody in the world could do that? It's, it's not gonna start there, we understand that, but how do we get there? 
that's the goal, right? When we think about disruption. It's really disruption through democratization. Um, and then, and then what I preface to everybody, all the young students on the call, the graduate students, I would preface, go back to the way it started. Build a dream into reality, just don't dream, right? And that's what I see a lot. And, and I think others on the call can see that a lot is, is we're in this world now where, where we're not starting small businesses. Like we're not, we're like, we're like casting a dream, we're selling a dream. And then it starts really big with thousands and thousands of dollars of venture capital and then we can't go back to small. We can't start and fail and start and fail anymore because people demand a return on my investment. So it's really like take your dream and start building it <laughs> and growing it. And, and that's how it works. That's how it's worked with the neo-domestication of crops. And that's the way we're applying that to this question and this entity that is 25-2, right? And so, so how does that work? And so you have to be very what I like to say scrappy with your mop, right? And so, and that's the way I was, as, as Jesse can attest to with the neo-domestication of, of the Vena Magna, you gotta be scrappy. You're not gonna get a ton of money, right? The USDA, whenever I started working on it, they said, hey, you need to work on these things that you're mandated to work on. And if you wanna do this, do it on the side at night in your own time, get your own money. Um, then when I was at General Mills, it was like, hey, you're at General Mills, we want you to work on these things. If you're gonna do that, that's great, but you're gonna figure out on the side. So you're gonna have to, Put your own lights in your own greenhouse. You're gonna to have to scrap and, and go after those things in the greenhouse. And then when it gets successful, guess what? Then everybody will want to help you do it, right? That's the way it works. And everybody will want to take credit for it. So you got to be okay with that because you got to remember your your mission is bigger than that. And so so how are we doing that now within this entity of, of 25-2? Well, it starts with building our pillars, right? And so what is it that we need? What disruptive technologies do we need to then make this fair in the world? And then the other thing that I learned from Jason and the people at Maiden Space, which I think this makes, it's really, it's really a good point even for you when you're building your collaborations is, you just talk to people about what your dream is, what you're building. You start showing them what you are building. And then you find out, do they have a similar dream? Do they have a similar passion? And if they have similar passions and a similar dream, then hey, maybe you guys should start walking together. Right? Maybe you should start walking together to chase your dream and their dream together because they're similar and they align. And if they don't, that's okay. You, you can go separate ways, but really building, building an organization and a group of people, you know, and starting as a small group of people, because Margaret Mead said, it's, you know, don't ever doubt that a small group of people could change the world because in fact, it's the only thing that ever has. It's one of my favorite quotes. But you think about that. Who is that small group of people that can build into that group of people that can do what you want and building those pillars? And so within our organization, the disruptive technologies, like I said, that we chose was, is we're going to build a new pillar and a technology in and around genomics. Everything starts at the genomics level. Since we started just over three and a half years ago, that's now morphed into two other components of the small molecule molecular world, which is now analytical chemistry and it's food safety um, within our organization. I'll show you on the, on the next slide. Um, just brought out of needs and other people's dreams that have come alongside that. That's that's led by by Teresa Yakovich, who is a, who's a microbial geneticist, microbiologist by training. Um, she comes to us out of the, the malt barley field with over 20 years of experience in analytical labs. Um, and then that moves um, with all that information, um, that moves into kind of like the machine learning pillar. Um, and so we, We've, we've built in our systems, we, we custom built our systems to deal with all the, the big data coming in from the uh, molecular small molecule pieces within the foundation of the crops we want that passes through. Um, and then that's then connected to the farm. Um, it's connected to our, the farm that we have within Idaho and with our seed technology and everything else because that's at the crux of what we do. Um, you also see our personalities, you know, within here. Um, so my daughter, who's now turning 17, um, she has a passion for uh, visual, um, you know, um, visual arts and, and, and AV. And so she, she's building out this kind of mission within our personality of how do we then express ourselves to the world? And, and you see that through this, this slide is, is depicted through movie posters, right? because um, we're telling a story as we go. And, and there's a consistency of like the fun of sci-fi. And I think that's really important. You, you, are, you are, as a scientist in these realms, you are living some days in science fiction. 
Um, but the goal is to make you know that science fiction reality again. Um, and so again, it just prefaced the, the the idea of daring to dream about what you're doing and building that dream. And so these are the pillars within our organization. And what do those really look like? And how do we then fund the things that we're doing? Um, because we're not a nonprofit organization, what we do. Um, I personally don't have a problem with nonprofit. I just don't do it in a nonprofit fashion. We're going to work and support clients. And we're going to use our profits to go do the things that we want to do with our collaborators in other parts of the world. Because, because I like that model because I'm not going there trying to help them. I'm going there partnering with them and learning together with them because they're the ones who are going to do it, not, not me in the future. So what we've done within our organization to fund this um, through our commercial aspects of this is we've built a really solid community, um, a, com a community of partners, of big organizations that we support within our work. And what do we do and how does our work start? Um, before, long before I even started my graduate work and, and now I'll get into where I went to school. So I, I know Jesse just doesn't want to say it because I was just another Southern Ag school by Kansas State. So, and it wasn't Kansas State. Luckily, it wasn't Oklahoma, right? So I'll give you that. But but when I was at my undergraduate work in, in Missouri, um, I was at a, a smaller institution in Missouri. Um, and then I met my wife, who's the co-founder of this organization and the CEO. She does the business side, the organizational side. Um, we used to sit around um, Friday nights. We'd, we'd save up enough money to go to a pizza joint and eat pizza and talk about where we thought we'd be in the next 10 to 15 years. And my talk, you know, when, when I was sharing with her, it would always center around just a passion for, for global seed diversity. Um, I was a big student, a big fan of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were both founders of the, the United States um, back in the, the early 1700s. Um, and if you look at the memoirs of Thomas Jefferson, just a year after the revolution, just a year after the birth of the United States, he was in Africa searching for um, crop diversity that he could bring back to the United States um, to help with the issues that were, they were seeing with the crops that they brought over when they came. And in his memoirs, one of the stories he's telling is, is he's saying that he's found new, new uh, uh, races or new strains of rice because he was hearing that the strains that he already passed over were overcoming some of the pestilence that was being found in the Southern states, right? And so he then pleaded with the United States government at that time to instigate or implement a, a group or people that would go out and do what he was doing. That he would go out as plant pioneers and collect these crops from all the world, bring them back to the United States. And if you go then to his farm in, in, in the United States now, his, his you know, the Monticello where, where he was doing a lot of this work, there's a quote on the wall that comes out of these memoirs. And it was when he was pleading with Congress to do this, he said, he said, because there's no greater, there's no greater service a man or a woman can add to his country than to provide a useful prop to its future. And, and that's what he was saying in his plea. So with that, Paul, for me, that, that's where this kind of, this passion kind of spurred, you know, thinking about, man, what about all this crop diversity going to Monticello as a kid? What, what does that look like? So the, the one major thing that we do within our organization now, learning this from the domestication of the hypergenia that I'm going to talk about, is this passion, this drive for, for accumulating global diversity of seed. So within our organization now, we are rapidly amassing a global seed collection that we will then grow out. So we have thousands of accessions of material um, we grow those out on our farm and then we purify those. And then once we purify that collection, then we digitize that collection. And what does that mean? That means one accession might become three purified strains out of that accession because it's kept in a heterogeneous state for a reason. And then we digitize that. Um, we do that through sequencing um, and through our sequencing in our cipher lab. That's why we have our, our pillar of our cipher. Um, and then we then put that into the machine, into that J system. Um, and then we utilize all that information within our partners then to create um, novel seed, right? For their end uses. And within every one of our contracts, with every one of our partners, that's a, it's a have to have, we don't take it out. 
we have a clause, a whole paragraph clause in our contracts that states anything that we create, um, you own the IP because we believe we do honest work for honest pay, but we have the right and the license to use that with our partners in the developing world, in the small shareholder world, and, and you, can't, you can't restrict that. Um, and so the people that we work with on this, this board here, on this slide, they've all agreed to do that. And what's been really cool is over the over the three years as we've been doing that, they see that and now they want to get involved. And so what we do is we have we have our base foundation of these partners that fund this work, and now they're starting to get involved in the work that we're doing um, overseas and 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 even in, within our own country now. But what, what I'll show you is we're trying to test this hypothesis: can anybody in the world be a plant breeder? Um, so we have a large fruit partner. Um, we have vegetable outdoor partner and an indoor partner. We have clean supplement partners and, and a grain and pulse partner, a barley partner, a hemp partner, and potato, and now we're moving into the, the, the livestock and feed. Um, what you'll notice about all these partners on this, and this is strategic building equity, is they don't, com they don't compete with one another. Um, so we aren't adding anybody to this community that competes with one another, and we use all of our tools and everything we do to service and develop novel seeds for these partners. Uh, because remember, our goal and our dream is we want to create, or we want to ask the, the question, can anybody in the world be their own crop developer, right? And so we're using these guys as our, our, our test model to do that, right? Um, as we then build those technologies and to, 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 to democratize those into the world. Um, and, and it's been really exciting to see that. And then, and then, and then we still hold to our, our global outreach um, partner, which is Context Global Development. We started with them, and I'll, I'll share about that, and we continue with them today um, through that domestication process. And I think that's a really important thing, too, because we understand our lane. I mean, our lane is building technologies. It's, it's developing novel seed. It's democratizing those tools and those abilities and teaching those to the world. We are not building an organization that could go in and, and get the governments of these different countries to allow us to be there, that's what Context does really well. So we partner with them because our dream of deployment in these countries is dependent on that and we, we care about that together. Their goal, what they're good at, is building the relationship with the governmental parties, paving the way for us to get there. Our passion, our drive is to bring the things there and then we partner together to then make those or pull those through to the finish line, which which you'll see in, 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 the, in the talk here as I, as I move forward. But as we also talk about that global outreach and, and we're kind of focusing on this question of, can anybody in the world do this crop development? Um, you know, one of the passions that I had with starting was, is can we do this at a, at a school level through education? And so Jesse's aware of this. Um, this was my hair brain idea when I was working with General Mills. It, it got me connected with NASA which I'm still connected with NASA <clears throat> on, this, on this topic, but it's building this system that's an educational system that can be used in classrooms <clears throat> that we call the crop grade. And so over the last three and a half years, we've been building this, deploying this, and working with schools on this. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a hydroponic system that's fully autonomous, um, that works on a desktop. It's, it's rough dimensions are roughly about, um, just under a meter wide by you know a quarter meter in depth and height, um, and so you you can see the picture of that on the bottom. You can see the rough schematic. We we have patented this technology, um, and and the really crux of this is is the ability to have a growing deck, which is a aqua hydroponic system where you can flood it. The the water comes off the same way it goes in. Um, it's all run um, by a computer that you program with an app. Um, you can control the lights um, in both a seeding area and then a growing area. It's got a shielded apparatus that goes around the plants, so you can control the, the terrestrial environment. Um, we can control um, the humidity. We can control the airflow, the temperature. We can also control the temperature in the hydroponic bay, so we can keep that cooler and keep the upper part warmer. Um, and we can control basically the light function of a red blue light to a full spectrum light. Um, and then you can also with, with the apparatus we put in and we're, we're building this into play now is you can introduce um, pollinators 
um, into the system and you can introduce um, just pathogens into the system and work very isolated in that system. Um, and then you can use the app technology and this is where it really comes to play. You can use the app technology um, to then do a lot of work um, in and around selecting crops from all over the world and then class classrooms can then run experiments and learn machine learning principles, learn uh, botany principles, they can learn um, food safety principles, just physical principles with this, so they can work um, a lot of different ways with this. They can even work, as I've shown on the top, with, with substrate principles, like with bacteria and substrates and things like that to learn the beneficial uh, symbiosis that occurs in root systems with, um, with bacteria and fungi with plants. Um, and so and the biggest thing here that we've, we've been working on with this system is learning how to miniaturize plants. My graduate advisor at the University of Arkansas, so I come to that now where I went to school and got my master's and PhD. My graduate advisor always told me, Eric, if you can miniaturize and speed up plants, um, then you can speed up the breeding cycle. You can speed up the, the breeding cycle. So this system, I can, I can share with you today, we've done a really good job at miniaturization and speeding up of plants. Um, right now, we're growing full-size tomatoes in these systems. We're growing cucumbers in these systems. We're growing peppers in these systems. These are like usually really big plants and we've shrunk them down to a matter of centimeters and they still flower and fruit just the same way and we can collect the seeds off of those. So we can make crosses in cucumbers, get a little bit of cucumber, we can slice it open and get about four or five seeds out of that cucumber and move that on to the next level. So that gets me really excited. And, and, and so where have we been building this? Like we haven't been building it in our lab. We haven't been building it in our, in our homes with our group, with, with educated scientists. We've been building this hand in glove with middle school students. Um, so we've worked really closely with this system with um, our middle school in Minnesota where we started. And now we've deployed this with the American Farm Bureau Federate, our foundation and seven different states and 30 schools. And they're starting to write curriculum now for the common core educational systems within the United States. Um, and we built this out now to where in three years, they wanna see this in 30,000 schools across the country. Our philanthropic organization, which is really cool with context, wants to match that internationally. And where we've also been deploying this and building this is we wanna get this into the Juarez's in Ethiopia. But what you see here to the right of this slide on, on your visual plane, is the diplomatic school, the German diplomatic school in Ethiopia, where there's um, where we deploy this with solar technology and everything else with these kids who are really smart. Um, some of them are the, uh, the diplomatic children of the German the government, but then they're integrated with kids from Addis Ababa um, and African kids that are from there. Um, and working there. And the goal is, is they will learn and they will adapt this technology and then they will take it to these places um, in, in the war is of Ethiopia. So, so we're doing this in parallel both. And I can tell you right now, um, probably my best story of this is after we deployed it within the middle school in my hometown where, where our company was, where we started our company. I was taking my son to school and I asked him, I said, how's the crop crate doing? And he said, dad, it sucks. It doesn't work, it leaks, nothing grows. It's a piece of junk. And I'm like, what? So then we went back to the school. We had like five of our scientists in the school working with the teachers. And within three months, I was going back to school and I said, so, so Leaf, I said, it's my son's name. I said, so I said, how's the crop crate doing that? And he goes, dad, it, it's awesome. It grows everything. We've been eating lettuce out of it. And I said, so that's a good thing, right? And he goes, yeah. He said, you know, I tell my friends at school and I said, yeah, that's just the way innovation works. It's hard and messy at first, but then you got to take time and figure it out. So I thought that was like really cool. So here's my son who's learning this. Um, what, what he was telling me before when he was saying, dad, it really sucks, is all of his buddies, and I didn't think about this, but all these buddies were saying, dude, your dad's technology sucks. It doesn't work at all, right? So now you can see where he was coming back to these kids saying, yeah, that's just the way science works, right? And so these lessons that are really important for everybody to learn is it, it's not all glamorous, right? Like you get it, you're gonna fail a lot. So we have this, this joke now because of this crop crate system where we're like, hey, look, like this is how this thing works. We like start an idea on the right side of the room and then there's this valley of death that we have to go through to get to the other side. And, and it's usually like, oh, that didn't work, oh, that didn't work. And when something makes it to the other side where we can actually file patents on it and stuff like this after several years of heartache and headache, then we go, 
whoa, that really worked, right? So now we're kind of getting there with our crop grade system. It was very similar, as I'll tell you, with the high protein note. Um, this is just the interface system that the kids can work with, where they can see with our little peanut, our AI system, our AUI system. We call it Carver after George Washington Carver and the big, huge fan of George Washington Carver. If you ever want to do some reading, read about the guy. He was amazing. Um, but our sensor that we built um, internally um, to measure CO2 temperatures um, and then oxygen and, and um, water levels and all that, we call that the PNAT. And that gives real-time display on this Heads Up app for these kids to look at, to do real-time measurements, to learn graph theory. They can program their lights, watering times, all that kind of stuff as they build their models. And then they can take data through that same application tool as they're monitoring. Um, and so this is really simplified, standardized data collection. I give credit to Jesse and, and Trevor. Um, a lot of this system came off the field book application technology that, that they've built and that we've used um, and we've deployed um, in places like Ethiopia and Morocco. So that's been an amazing tool set. Um, that's really Jesse's vision of, of remote sensing and phenotyping. Um, and then we've kind of moved that now to where, um, to further standardize that, we're using vision learning in our analytics. Um, and so now what we do is we just have a photo booth where we can pop these little bodas with the plants in them out and we can stick it in a photo booth and with their phone, they can image the, up, the top, the side, and then the root structure of the plants on a daily basis and we can get area and growth of all these different components. Um, and now we're turning this into like a virtual race between classrooms. So, so again, the idea then is miniaturization, acceleration, and we're using middle school kids and high school kids to help train us, to train our models um, so we can democratize this all over the world. So everybody benefits. And so it's a real community, like a community seed bank then, right? Because all this information is being cast over all these varieties. And so how does that all start? These kids have 1,600 lettuce varieties, 400 um, basil varieties, 500 cucumber varieties from all over the world that they can select based on a series of constraints with the system. And, and what we're finding is most of them just selected based on the, where it came from in the world to start with. Then they take measurements on it and they train their system and then they do it again. And then they, they build a model, they pick on the attributes that they're scoring, and then they validate it with another subset that they select, and then they train it and they do it again. So they're learning machine learning principles while they're building a knowledge base around all this global seed that becomes a community seed bank, right? With a lot of information wrapped around it. It's all digitized and available. And so for me, like that's building a passion for students just to be basically in love with what they do, to enjoy their work, right? And why is that important? So now I'll get to the crux of the, the talk. Um, because you have to have a passion for learning, right? Like, like you guys are all there, you're all in your classes, you're all doing what you're doing. But remember why you're there. Be passionate about what you do, right? Or don't do it, right? <laughs> Go do something else, right? Life is short, right? Like, like be passionate about what you do and, and love it, right? And so, so when I started and left the USDA, or sorry, when I left the University of Arkansas um, in Central United States, I moved to the to the to the southeast side of where I'm in today, right? To work where at the Global Seed Repository with the United States Department of Agriculture in Aberdeen, Idaho, a town of like less than two thousand people in the middle of nowhere, right? But my passion drove me there. Why? Because I was enamored by global seed global seed diversity. And that was the largest collection of grain in the United States in Aberdeen. Now I know Colorado would argue they've got the other one. Kansas State's got a really cool wheat collection. But, but, that's, where, but that's where I went. That's where I landed because of that alone. And when I got there, I was going to be work, moving from soybean, a you know, major row crop in the United States, to, to oat, right? And I'm like, what? Like, okay, I went from a world of of soybean and, and genomics and everything else to oat oh, with nothing, right? Uh, a very, uh, uh, an ancient tetraploid, now diploid, to a messy hexaploid, right? Um, and so when I got there, I was like an amber bus. I was looking at, okay, what are all the oats? What are the types of oats? And that's where uh, Dr. Rick Jellin, who's the head of the Department of 
of life sciences BYU that I mentioned before, um, he is like a plant, like if you think about anthropologists, he's a plant anthropologist and probably one of the leading anthropologists and knowledge bases of oat on the planet today. And he studied under all the icons of the oat world, like Gideon Ladzinski out of Israel, Mike Leggett out of, out of the UK, um, Ron Phillips, um, Dion Stephan, these guys at the University of Minnesota, these, these, these kind of icons in these, these fields like Howard Rines. So he studied under all those guys to learn a knowledge of man, what is oat and where did it come from, okay? So just to, to clear everybody in is we don't have a clue in a vena, in the genus of vena, and a vena sativa, common oat today, the hexaboid species. We don't have a clue where the three genomes actually came from. You know, we, don't, we don't have a definitive answer on where they came from. Um, what does the story look like? Um, oat is like wheat, there's, there's diploid species. Um, so on this slide, this is kind of the centers of origin of oats when you think about it. So, so we have an A and a C and a, and a, and a B and a D genome. Um, most people don't kind of realize that there is like what we call a D genome in some of the diploids. Um, but we have an A, C and a D genome. Um, and there's a B series of diploids too. Um, but if you look at this um, and you see kind of the, the, the path of oat. So if we look at the, the Western side, you know, the, the kind of Turkey and down to Ethiopia, there's like one center of domestication where you have the, the DD genome of Canariensis and the CC of Ventricosa. And then you have the Barbada tetraploids of the AABB genomes. And then further down, um, into Ethiopia, you have the AA genomes of Atlantica species, and then you have the Abyssinica and, and Babylonian species of the AA BB genomes. So those are, those are known centers for domestication of those. And as you come across to the eastern side into, into kind of the Iberian Peninsula and down into Morocco, here's where you'll find like the, the diploid canariensis, and then the Murphy eyes, and the Magnus, and the Agadarias. Agadaria is what I call it. Agadarina is what, what I guess it's officially called. And so that's where you have the centers of origins for those diploids and tetraploids. And then when you, when you look at it kind of in the center of the, the med, <laughs> this is where the story gets interesting. Um, this is where we find Avina insularis. And, and from where we can piece things together, we, we kind of believe the most common ancestor to Avina sativa, the common oath that we use today, is a, is a a distant relationship to Insularis and then Insterilis, right? It came and emerged out of that, which then became Avena sativa, um, which is which is very interesting. Um, and so the way these things work is, you know, as glaciation is pushed down and then rescinded, that's where these oats have kind of moved up and down along these two parts of the African continent into kind of Asia Minor Europe and up into the European Iberian Peninsula. And so what we kind of know today is within these species, um, Insularis is probably the closest and this is where they derive from. And I, and I show you pictures over the side of, of kind of the wild oats as, as it moves along into that, into that kind of area. You can see its hairiness, its, its, its long awns, um, hard husk, um, very much in relationship to some of the brown grasses um, of its time. And so when you think about this, as they study this, this is where um, Mike Leggett and Gideon Ladisinski spent a lot of their time trying to, to course out where did oat come from and all the different species that exist, you know, with, within oat today. And so I was getting a really good understanding and trying to piece this puzzle together to see, see okay, where did the A genome come from? Okay, the canary sides, right? Where, where did you know, we look at the, the C genome come from, you know, looking through that, at, you know, some of the types of, of, of insularis and then pushing over the D genome. And where did that come from? Over a karyetsis meeting in the middle of the med and moving up. So that's been, that was really fascinating to me and interesting to me. Um, at the same time, when I was studying this, um, you're thinking of this passion for learning. Then there's also a passion for people, right? And that's, that's where this was melded together. So at my time with USDA, what I was commissioned to do at the time was, was right in that 2007, I was there in 2004, and right in that 2007 time, um, the UG99 stem rose pathogen emerged. And so one of my 
jobs that I was tasked with after that was to go to Kenya and then screen the entire wheat collection for resistance to UG99. And so I was like, okay, how are we gonna do this? There's thousands of collections. So what I did in, in Aberdeen, Idaho is I built these very large outdoor, basically mobile home greenhouse structures. So I, I went to the lumber yard, bought all the lumber, got the uh, plastic ordered in. And what I would do is I'd plant little hill plots. So you can see inside of these large structures. So these are um, about 30 meters long, almost 40 meters long. And they're about uh, 10 meters wide. So they're very large. Um, and I would go in and I would plant all these little hill plots of all the accessions of wheat. And then I'd make a race structure with Puxinia graminus that I was able to use in the United States that would give me a decent reaction to these plants because you don't, Idaho's a dry area, so you don't get disease. So then what, that's why I needed these big like units. So I'd go in at the night and I would spray the inoculum on all these plants and then I would get it wet and then I would cover it through the night, right? When it would get really cold because it's it's warm during the day, similar probably to where you guys are warm during the day. Um, it's up to 80, 90 degrees, um, up to 100 degrees sometimes in the summertime. And then at night it cools down to 50. And so by putting that moisture in there, covering it right before, you know, the sun went down, then overnight you would get this massive dew cloud to form in these, these houses. And then in the morning I'd race back over to an hour and then I would uncover them so they wouldn't melt all my plants during the day. And I would get these beautiful artificial epidemics in the field. Um, and then what I was doing with the race structure and with all the lines that I was picking out is I was building a model to figure out what lines I thought would be resistant, moderate resistant, moderate susceptible. And I would just take that subset as a validation set over that Kenya and study that. Um, when I was over there for the first time in my life, I was really introduced to you know, true need in individuals, right? Where I was seeing people that, that were working really hard just to survive, right? Not, not to feed their wants, but to give them their needs, right? And I would see this represented, and you can see this picture over to the right as I was talking to the students. At least two kids were related. The difference between the one on the screen, left side, the tall one in the white shirt, and the one in the kind of the brownish shirt was one family had a cow, the other one didn't. So this was, this was epitomized to me as protein starvation, right? This is what happens when you don't get enough essential protein, you don't get enough essential fats you can have dwarfism, right? And just lack of development. And this just crushed me, right? So what did that drive in me? This passion for the work that I was doing, um, passion for learning and passion for people, was it brought me right back to this understanding of, you know, the solution that, that what can I do about this, right? What, what could I do about this, right? This was back in 2007. Well, in 2000, when I got there and I was studying this and I, and I met Rick, Rick brought me a totally new species of oak. And we looked at this idea that, do you realize that more than 60% of the world's calories come from cereal grains in the world, right? I'm like, okay, well, what does the macronutrient load of a cereal grain look like? When we look at corn, this figure represents the whole grain of corn and what percentage of corn is starch what percentage is protein, what percentage is fat, and then what percentage is the fibers, total dietary fiber and beta glucan. A whole lot of corn is starch. What about rice? Very similar. What about wheat? No offense, Jesse, wheat's a little bit better, but still not great, right? What about common oat, right? Getting a little bit better. But this is a wrapped around picture of the most common cereal grains that are being used in the world and what percentage of their macronutrient load is actually useful calories. This was super disturbing to me. But as I said before, like in 2004, when, when Rick brought me um, into this kind of world of oat and, and oat anthropology, he had told me the story of Gideon Latizinsi and Mike Leggett when they were searching for the ancestor of oat and that, that that picture I showed you, the, the northern tip of Africa and Europe. Um, and he told me the story when Gideon Latizinsi and Mike Leggett were searching out the ancestor boat and they were going into Morocco. And they weren't able to get into Morocco 
um, Gideon was not able to get into Morocco because of his um, um, being Israeli at the time. So they blocked him. So Gideon, being a super smart guy, what he did is he started going to all the Andalusian graveyards along the border of Morocco. So for those of you who don't know, the Andalusian people, when the, when the, when the Christians came down um, into Spain, they pushed the Andalusian Muslim people out of southern Spain and down into Morocco and then across Morocco. So if you think about coming down from the across the Straits of Gibraltar into places like Fez and then over to like Rabat, this is the migratory path of these people as they were trying to survive through this persecution phase that was happening. And then that rescinded, whenever that rescinded and was pushed back, they moved back into those areas. So Gideon, what he was doing is he's going into these undisturbed areas where he's looking on the periphery of these graveyards and he was looking for anything in that graveyard that looked like an oak. So you imagine this, this Jewish scientist that's sitting on the edge of this Muslim graveyard looking in and saying, oh, okay, there's an oak over there, right? I want that oak. So then he would go get the uh, Muslim cleric and, and then he would ask him, if we, could you go in there and could you capture and collect some of those oat seed for me? And so I, I had the privilege um, to actually spend two days with Gideon Latizinski and hear him tell me these stories. These are his stories. I don't know if they're real stories. They're super cool. This is the funny part about these stories. He would tell me, oh, Eric. And so I asked him to go there and he'd go, oh, no, no, no. And he'd bring this out. And so he brought this oat out to him. And then he, he was wondering, is this is this the progenitor of the, that was his question. So when he, when he got those oats and he took them back to um, Israel and he studied those oats and he found out to his dismay that no, they actually were not, this was not the progenitor of Avina Sataya, it was actually Avina Magnum. And then he found though that it was flowery. And so he started studying that and looking at that. And what he found was, is that oat contained over 25% of its macronutrient load in protein. So he spent the next 30 years of his career, this was in 1960s, he spent the next 30 years of his career trying to domesticate Avena Magna by bringing in domestication syndrome genes from Avena Sativa. And as you, if you read the paper, and we'll talk about this in Journal Club, he was able to create a line of BA1313, which had a lot of the domestication syndrome genes that you would want transferred over, but lost all of its protein and macronutrient load that he was trying to achieve um, through the process. Um, and so that you imagine this whole career of this guy and getting to that point. Um, and then what was cool was is Rick went over and did a sabbatical with him in the 19 in the 1990s. And he was hearing the story and Gideon gave him some of that seed as well as the wild seed. Um, from that um, that work that he had done and said, go take this, Rick. So again, standing on the shoulders of giants, take that. That's what Rick brought to me in 2004. And he said, Eric, take this, right? <laughs> You've got these crazy ideas, take this, go work on it. It was in 2007 when I saw the need for this. And I look at this slide and say, look at the variation, look at the benefit to this, that I said, you know what? This can do something about that. This is the solution, right? This is a solution. It might not be the solution, but it's a, but it's a solution to this problem. And then I embarked on my 14-year journey to do the work of neo domestication of this crop, bringing this crop for the first time back to the world, right? In a domesticated state. The reason why is because this is what this crop looked like <laughs> whenever I received it from Rick Jellin. Um, could you put this in a planter? No. This thing is designed to plant itself. Um, once this thing gets wet, it's articulated on, it will start to spin, it will right side it up, and it will drill itself right into the ground. The hairs on the seed, designs where it won't pop back out of the ground, but it'll actually auger itself in and get stuck and drive, it, drive itself down. This plant wants to shatter, it wants to have dormant seed, and it doesn't want that seed to come out and wants to protect it. So these are all the things that you have to get rid of to make this thing be plantable, to germinate, to actually, to actually, um, uh, what you would say, flower within a period of time that makes sense before you hit the rainy season or the freeze or the frost season into the winter. So these are all the things that have to be overcome to unlock all this macronutrient load that has the potential to change or or be a benefit to a world that needs it. 
So this was the mission, right? It was just clear to me, okay? Just gotta do that, right? Not hard. Um, so where do you go, right? Big fan of the Incans and Mayans. If you go down into La Plaza and these places in the Alta Plana, Peru, Bolivia, um, down in Chile, you go to these places, you'll, you'll come across these high plateau, high elevation, 10,000, 10, you know, we're, we're, we're up to three to 4,000 meters in height. You will find these outdoor laboratories. You know, what are these things? Deep holes in the mountains, terraced off at one to two meter terraces. And what you can see from this picture, very dry on the top, very green on the bottom. They can control the water flow down into the to this outdoor laboratory, and they can control climatic changes all the way through this system. When you go and listen to these people that, that are telling the historical backgrounds of these things, they will tell you they were using this as a way to take things like tiacente and make it corn, right? They would take papas and turn them into potatoes that we see today by moving them up and down these, these plateaus and giving stressed, giving stressed environments within which would result in uh, mutations of the female gamete, which would then result in heritable change that would domesticate crops rapidly. This was, these were the stories they're telling and I'm listening to these stories and I'm like, whoa, okay. So, so heritable change through different types of variation. And when you're talking about a handful of genes, not thousands and thousands or every gene, but a handful of genes that represent domestication, you could do this rapidly by using this type of methodology. And this wasn't, this wasn't not known to other people. In, in, 19, in the 1980s, Ken Fry, who is one of my one of my heroes in the scientific world. He's a farm kid from Michigan, professor at Iowa State. Everybody at his time thought he was a nutcase, right? <laughs> he wasn't. Like in the mid 1980s, worked with um, Stan Cox, um, and he was a K State guy, right? Jesse, so working with State, Stan Cox at the time was really cool. He published a paper that stated that, that when taken stress induction, on barley and different crops, that the phenotype or the genetic variants within a cultivar could, could be attributed not to residual, residual heterozygosity or to constant mutation, but to increasing mutation rates, primarily in low fertility propagation environments. He was showing the same thing that the Incans and Mayans were showing, that, that this variation, this heritable variation was coming out of these stress-induced environments, right? That, that can show heritable change over time. So this was in the mid 1980s and, and Ken Fry was, was preaching this to scientists throughout his area and, 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 he, and people were missing it, right? The Incans and Mayans knew this, right? So then what, when I was taking all this in, I was like, dude, this is a way to go out and rapidly domesticate crops by introducing all types of variation through recurrent selection cycles of a singular genetic entity right? Not residual heterozygosity or, or constant mutation, but increasing mutation rates put on by stress, right? And I know as I was going back and forth with Jesse, you guys are working on a lot of halophytes are working in drought tolerant areas, and you're, you're going to see a lot of mutation rates increase throughout these crops that you can select on even in sin single genetic entities, which is really cool. The plant is gonna want to adapt to the changing environment. We have to select on it, right? That's my argument. That's my thesis, right? So how did this work, right? This started in 2004. Um, at the top left, you can see hairy oats. Um, I, I, I like to always joke with this. Um, I think you can see my small picture on my thing and I'll use this right here. I actually have the original oat right here in my hand. So if you can see my, my picture, right? So that's that guy right there. So he started there, um, went through a series of stress induction, used a lot of different biological types of stresses, chemical types of stresses, just firing a lot of these. Scaled that one seed up to 10,000, 
induced all this variation, this, or sorry, induced all this stress, and then selected, selected lines that were a little bit better, that had a little bit less, had a little bit less over time. Um, what's really cool then is after the second round of this, and what did this look like? So this is how this looks. This plant planted in Idaho, you plant it as soon as the snow comes off the field, sometimes late March, you get it in the ground, takes two to three weeks of weeding before it comes up because it's dormant. <laughs> you find ones that come up sooner, you tag those plots. That grows up, you're measuring its distance, its lodging, its heights, those things are easy. You bag every single head of 10,000 individual plants. So imagine bagging every single head. Then when it's snowing, you're in the field, you're pulling those bags off and you're grabbing seed out of those bags. And then one by one, you're handy hauling every single one of those seeds from those heads to get another 10,000 seeds and make selections, take those lines, get another 10,000 seeds out of those and do it again, and then do it again, <laughs> and then do it again. And what you start finding is like seeds that look like this, that have a little less hair, right? A little bit cleaner, ons aren't as articulated. And how do you find those, right? Well, you find lines that germinated and came up just by doing the work not glamorous. You find lines that don't fall over. You find lines that, wait a minute, I'm not harvesting this one in the snowstorm, right? And then as you touch them and feel them, you start to handy hold her. One of them, I used to do this to my kids in the living room or watching things and I'd let them play with the oats as they were tumbling across the table because it's a lot of work. When you start to realize, wait a minute, that one didn't, that one wasn't as hard to, to de-hole. Um, the way they used to find counterfeit bills in the United States, the story goes, is they would handle a lot of real money. Why? Because then when a counterfeit bill came across, they knew it was counterfeit. So when I dawned on me, I was like, as you're doing the work and you're intimate with the work, you start to realize, wait a minute, when something's new, that's a counterfeit. So what I'm trying to find is a counterfeit, right? So I'm finding all the counterfeits through each generation of induction of stress, induction of stress, and you just keep getting further and further along until you get to a stage like this, where you have an oat that has little to no on, right? Very globose now, becoming very smooth, um, and you're having very little hair, so it's starting to look like a regular oat. That was after three different rounds of this happening. At this time in my career, I knew two things. I knew I was gonna need a machine system to tell me which lines to cross to get my recombinations, to get it to where I needed it to be. And I needed a supply chain to get it to the world. So at the time I was working with Jesse, we were doing the Global Oat Research Collaborative Enterprise. We were building genetic tools. I needed those genetic tools. I needed Jesse's knowledge on GBS, like all this kind of stuff and sequencing. So we were working together, same dreams, similar dreams. We were doing this work rapidly but I also realized that my time with USDA was gonna to come to an end because they weren't gonna get me into the places I needed to be in Africa. They weren't gonna build a supply chain to get me there. So I gave up my job, my academic job, and I went to work at General Mills because their senior technology officer was the guy who created Partners in Food Solution. I made a deal with him that I said, hey, if you help me do this, I'll help you with this. And we agreed to do that. And then I left to go to General Mills and then I built a relationship with John Saul, who was, only, who was one of the founders of SAS, and said, look, John, this is my story. Like, I've been doing this work. I showed him those oats, the transitional forms of these oats. I told him where I wanted to go with the work. And I said, now, can I use your platform? Because I was trained in SAS. I was trained in Jump. Can I use your platform to Jump and build a genomics entity within, within Jump to help me do cross simulations, cross evaluations with the genetic information and phenotypes? So I know which ones of these founder lines, of these BAM lines you see at the bottom, these founder lines that I need to cross together, which siblings I need to then top cross, back cross, do all the crossings so I can get the genes that now I have mutations in all in one package really rapidly, right? And he said, sure, go work with Russ, we'll finger in those guys and get it done. So that's what I did. So I, I helped them build that program and they helped me come up with this program so that I could do this work really quickly. And so we started intercrossing the gene pool, optimizing the training sets and doing the cross evaluation sets and everything else. And what we're able to come up with 
um, were a series of lines that you see at the top that are the Vena magna species domestica within just four years of the onset of that intercrossing um, that were fully, um, what I would say, domesticated. And I don't know if you could see that, but those are the oat species off of that last one that we have now that are fully domesticated. And these are these lines. And you can see the genetic similarity sharing matrix with the founder line, which is in the middle, and how what the percentage of the genetics is and all the mutations that are being pushed into those versus other avena magna lines. Um, so if you look across there, the other avena magna lines, and then the lines on the bottom, which are common oaks, showing just the different clads and relationships to the domestic lines, um, the little sharing similarity matrix with the founder line, the other avena magna lines, and then common oaks um, as it goes. Um, we used with Jesse GBS um, to genotype these by sequencing. We overlaid those onto the Avena Magna map, which we were able to build with the collaborative approach or with the collaborative research enterprise that Jesse talked about. We overlaid them onto the barley genome. We overlaid them onto the, the rice genome on the bottom and the maize genome on the right bottom, so left bottom and right bottom. And these are markers that, that are in relationship to those genomes. And what we found was on chromosome 12D, this is the region <laughs> where we were able to move and do most of our work on the domestication gene. So this is the biggest group. So if I would have said domestication and amina magna was in this cluster of this cluster of the chromosome segment on the distal end of chromosome 12 in relationship to oat. It's on barley chromosome 7 with microsensitine, where the new gene is. Um, so the free threshing genes in barley, the new gene on chromosome 7, right in the middle. It's on the bottom of chromosome 9 in rice, where you have this free shattering genes. Um, and the bigger story is it's on the bottom of chromosome 10 in relationship to maize, where there's a really nice paper that shows that the domestication, the largest chunk of genes for the domestication of Tia Sente into corn today or maize today are a big group of genes right there on chromosome 10 on the distal arm right there, which matches what we're seeing in oat. So again, that, that hypothesis driven that this is the region that we were making the most change through mutations in Avena magna to bring about the domestication syndrome that I showed you here today. And it aligns, it aligns with what we're seeing um, in corn and, and other crops. Um, so where did that go within General Mills? Um, we planted our first acre. So I saw the first time a crop was ever grown in its, in its first acre um, to its next 30 acres to the next 300. And so this was the big thing that I'll also preface on you when I was at General Mills. You have to make it valuable, right, to pull it through. So with, within General Mills, we actually grew 380 acres of this in Idaho. I then took it down and, and spent time in St. Angard's um, Isla at a, at a mill where we dehold it and we processed it into flakes. So I spent like several weeks there with them learning. There was a K-State guy that ran the, the mill. So I said, when I got there, I was like, hey, there's a K-State milling guy here. We'll figure it out. It wasn't easy. We plugged the mill four times getting this thing through, right? Because um, it wasn't common. It's not new. It's, it's, it's new. It's not common. So it was great to have him. He loved it. It was, again, innovation for him. We shipped it down to um, Australia where they put it into Uncle Toby's um, protein big bowl. And the biggest thing about this, if you look at it, it's 10 grams of protein per serve. They put this in the test market against a bunch of other products. Um, a, a dear friend of mine now um, who ran the Uncle Toby's group in Australia called me up and said, hey, Eric, today's the day. He goes, I'm just going to let you know. He said, it's going to fail. <laughs> no worries, mate. <laughs> and I'm like, what, John? And he's like, it's going to fail. It didn't get an end cap, it, which is the corner of the store that's the most highlighted. It's like buried in the back. Three weeks later, um, I got a message from my boss at General Mills because I had since left the company. And she told me, she said, Eric, nobody's going to tell you this. She said, but it performed at 150% of the market value. Everybody inside General Mills told me nobody will buy this based on protein. All of our research, all of our, all of our stuff told me it won't sell. So it's going to fail. And then you're going to do what we want you to do. Because I could never fit in at General Mills. 
it was worth it, right? My goal wasn't to get it on the product shelves. I, I wanted to because I was using and leveraging General Mills's ability to get it on product shelves and see what people thought about it. It graded out as a premium product in flavor, in, full, in fullness, in nutrition. People wanted it, right? It was amazing. It tastes better than common oat in oatmeal. It's amazing, right? And so that's really exciting for me because what does that mean for the people that we're working with it on in other places? And so at, at the same time, we never lost sight of the goal. Um, we have put this into three countries over the last four years now in Morocco, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, where we've been working with this. One of the biggest highlights of this work was getting to hang out and work with Awafa Bulanabam, who's a professor at the IAB in Rabat, Morocco. She's a dear friend of mine today. Um, she's, she's come and hung out with my family. I hang out with her family when we go to Morocco. Um, one of the things that I did when I took my first trip to Morocco was, is I went into Mike Leggett. So he was the other group that Gideon Ladizinski, right? He had done a huge collection. He was allowed to get into Morocco. He had done a huge collection in and around Morocco of Vina Magna and stored that in the, in the global seed collections. So I pulled all that seed out and I, and I genotyped all that seed. And I was looking for anything that was close to the Amina Magna line that I had, right? And what I found was, is there's two collection spots in this map that are represented by the little dots, the P3326 and the P3321. And those were the two closest to the Vena Magna that I had, the original Vena Magna at the bottom. So I told Wafa this, I said, Wafa, I want to go to this, that, this valley right here, right? <laughs> and she's like, God willing, we will, Eric. And so I didn't know what that meant, but she had rented a four by four vehicle. And we were driving up from the south of this image, the bottom of this image. We went up to the blue road on the left side of the image going into the town that's on the top, kind of in the train side. We got up halfway and we just cut it cross country and we're bouncing up and down on this like donkey path, right? And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, this is where you wanted to go. And we ended up in this valley that's in this picture. And I'm racing everywhere. Like I'm, I'm running around like this like kid in a candy store. Like this is where I've always wanted to be. Was this the center of origin of the Vena Magna that I've been working on, right, for all these years? So I'm racing all through this valley and looking for things and, you know, picking all these oats up. I was like, oh, diploid oats, throw this one there, diploid oats, this one there. I was like, oh, there's all kinds of diploid oats, everything else. Like it was super fun. Um, but yet I couldn't find anything that was a Vena Magna, right? So it was kind of like, you know, you find it, it's still undisturbed. There's hope. You start looking, hope's starting to wane. After 40 minutes of searching frantically, nothing. I come walking down the valley and Wafa's holding two clumps of oats, just two clumps of oats. And she looks at me, and, I, and this is burned into my memory. Never forget this. She looked at me and she said, Eric, she said, this is a Vina Magnum. This is Moroccans, right? And I just, and that just changed everything for me because what it told me was, you're right. This is yours. This isn't mine. This is your antiquity. This is yours. And we're bringing it back to you, right? We're bringing it back to help in your villages and the places that you want to help, Wafa. What a moment, right? Of scientific, you know, endeavor. It's like, this is where everything came to a head. And I said, it was all worth it. All the struggle, all the pain, everything else was all worth it because I get to stand in this moment in this valley of her. So we took that back and I genotyped it. So here's, I, I picked out one that I thought might have been a Vena Magna from Virginia over in the corner and in the where she was. So I did all this. Um, if you look at the relationship to the original parent, these are the two oats that Wafa had picked out in relationship versus one of the ones that we got from a different area that I picked out. I'm not saying this was the center of domestication, but I'm saying, hey, just might have been, right? So I can, I can now live that story I've got some empirical evidence. I can play with it, um, but what a joy. And then I went back to Rick and I was telling him the story and Rick goes, you're an idiot. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, all those diploid species you were picking up, those could have been like a heightened of all the recombination that formed this and you didn't even collect any. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. So the other thing that I preface, don't get too excited when you're in somewhere. Take a deep breath, settle down and learn while you're there, right? Don't just don't just have the passion of trying to find, learn while you're there, be a student in every environment. So, so that was kind of a learning curve for me, but super exciting um, to have those memories. Bigger yet though, 
is where the story goes, and we'll talk about this in Journal Club, though, but this is what we built in Morocco with local on-farm relationships um, for evaluation. We're in all these sites within this map, um, building a business interest, right? Cooperative extension and development and, and grow local economies through education. These are all the things that are important. These are all the things that we need a context to do. What does this look like at these different locations? That's what it looks like. Like I, I always joke because I say I was I was a month before I was planting with a tractor and a planter in Idaho, and the and the less than a month later I'm behind an emaciated horse with small shareholder farmers planting research trials within several kilometers or a few kilometers of the center of origin of this oak. Which one was more meaningful for me, right? And it doesn't look pretty, right? But we're in the ground with WAFA, with these farmers that we have passion to help and building relationships. Um, these field plots can be in the middle of, of like olive orchards, right? Or, or nut orchards, right? Um, you know, when you talk about argon, they're in the middle of these orchards. They're in dry environments, right? Um, we're working directly, and Jesse, you can see we have your field book application, teaching these, these students, these, these really cool students on, on the right, a really dear friend of mine, Tatum from Senegal. I will never forget the third year into this, and he was um, one of the lead authors on our paper doing this work. I'll never forget driving to one of the field locations where we spend two weeks in Morocco with him as we do doing evaluations and teaching him how to use these tools and asking Tatum what he wanted to do. And he looked at me and he said, Eric, I want to do what you did with the high protein oak for my people in Senegal. And I'm like, dude, totally, let's do it. What crop do you want to do? This, this, this was the idea. Can anybody in the world develop their own crops? This is how you do it. I don't need to take it to them. I need to give them the tools. Jesse's building tools. Democratize those tools to these people. Get them in their hands. Let them do it. What was the outcome? In 2018, in the fall, we planted this in these different locations. Uh, Hanifra, Beni Mal or, uh, Bershed, um, um, Bouchen, all these places in, in, in Morocco. After we planted in these, in these areas, every two out of three years, they get a severe drought. You know, changing climate, changing environment, severe drought. They get, they get nothing coming out of their fields. I mean, this is, this is the problem. This is a major issue within Morocco right now. Um, we planted in 2018 in the fall going into December. They got no rain all the way till the very end of the growing season. We talk about that in our paper, right? Um, when we went back in June, we thought it was going to be a disaster. What we found was this was at Hanifra. This was Rashid's um, mother, um, cool dear friend of mine now too. She would always make us these really cool meals of piles of couscous with all these vegetables after we do our planting. Um, this is her standing there. She came out and gave me a big hug, right? Um, she was so elated, so excited. We were harvesting Avena Magna oak in these, these poor soils with no rain all year. Um, you can see the field around us, plenty of grain on the heads. So we look at this. Um, story doesn't stop here. We go up into the high atmosphere, very few rain, full of grain. These seeds are full of grain. These aren't massive agricultural areas with planted row seeds. These are small paddock little plots that these guys are subsistence farming on. Still grain in. The most clear picture of this was at this um, Sheik's farm, who's a businessman, Ada Kadu, in, um, in um, Bershed. And we were harvesting these grain with his family. They were so excited. Like, remember, zero rain. This was the barley field that was sitting right adjacent to that field. Like, you look at that thing, it looked like it had been torched absolutely no harvest at all versus what you're seeing as harvest here with his family. He was elated, right? Super elated, right? That he had something in a drought year that he was going to be able to feed his family with and make products out of with this, with this cooperative. And not only was it just an oat grain, it was an oat grain when you look at the left with a macronutrient load that's much better than common grain and a vitamin and mineral content on the right that's far superior to the common types of oats that they could grow. So common oats on the left, Avena Mag on the right. This is my daughter in the first 30 acres, and, I, and I'd like to show this picture all the time because her shirt says, never, ever give up. 
and she's holding the domestication of the species that we're able to bring back to Morocco. And why is that important? Because when they have severe droughts in these environments, like their kids are, are susceptible. Their kids are susceptible to being taken to other places and, and being um, tons of things happening to them. And so whenever we were doing this early on, the Minister of Education of Morocco was talking to us and he was saying, Eric, you, you can't stop this. You've got to keep doing this because bad people are co coming in here and making these farmers do bad things because of the risk to their children if they have a drought year. And he said, Eric, you need to keep doing this because that will stop them from doing that because they have food and they have food on the table when these things happen. So that this was the ultimate for me is harvesting with his family and then having these little girls and kids come up to me and being thankful that they had something um, that was cool. Not only did they have something though, this is what's really cool. Like Ada Cutter and his team created couscous and a breakfast cereal out of this within their women's share co-op in Rushain, Morocco. And it got graded out as a premium product. So the tale of two very distinct, you know, images here for everybody is all that work in domestication has to go all the way through to the very end, even though sometimes you don't want to do, right? Why? Because it'll change people's lives and build an economy, much like the Uncle Toby story. Otto Cutter and his group has created their own Uncle Toby story, and it's getting the same benefit. It's a premium product now that this small shareholder and subsistent farming community can now sell on the market that is Moroccans, right? We have three varieties released in Morocco, and now we're releasing two in Ethiopia, and there's two on the way for Nigeria. And we're starting to replicate this model of how this domestication occurred, and we're doing it with Adina Abyssinica. We're doing it with other crops, right? And so that's, that's the goal. Can anybody in the world do this? And how do we democratize it? So hopefully that that was interesting to everybody. Um, I know maybe it went a little long. I think I had the time, Jesse. So sorry if it did, but there's a whole lot of this story um, and a lot of it to not that hasn't been told yet. But what I'm super excited about is um, it's not this story for me. What I who I really want to tell the story is I want Awafa to tell the story on the TED Talk sometime and share that because like that's the amazing people in this story is like Awafa and Tayan and, and Tespahun and all these people that we're working with right now. And I'll just, I'll just end with that. Um, when I was sitting at the end of some of these fields and somebody asked me, this has got to feel really good, Eric. And I said, no, actually it's bittersweet. And they're like, why? And I said, because it's the journey that matters, right? I don't want to arrive. Like, I don't want to arrive in this moment. Like, like what I want to do is enjoy the journey along the way as I build the science, my craft, as I get to do that with people that are really cool and really matter, because that's what really matters in life, right? And I can never, ever go back and do that again. So don't just try to arrive, right? Like even where you're at today in your, in your institution and in your classes, don't just try to arrive. Do something meaningful. Do it disruptively. And, and it's okay to start small and fail and grow big. Enjoy that moment, enjoy that time. Because you're gonna look back on your career in 10 years, 15 years, if you're just trying to arrive, and you're gonna be like, man, I missed it. Like I missed all those oats in that valley. Don't miss it. That's what I'll be for you guys. Okay, good. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Great stories. Um, so Eric filled up all of our time. I don't know if we have oh, yeah, no questions. <laughs> no, he takes takes too much time, and then there's no questions left for him. But yeah, if you know Eric for any length of time, he's always got plenty of great stories, and so uh, you can't give him any amount of time without getting like extra stories and um, take you through the whole adventure. So I hope everybody see though this really great story on how the domestication and bringing basically an entirely new species into a crop is, is a lot more than just the genetics, right? You have to have, and this is something we've talked about and think about, you have to have all these pieces of the agronomics and the supply chain and things that as, you know, as plant biologists, as, as, as plant breeders, things that you usually don't think about at all. 
right? If you make a whole new species in a new crop and it's got no market, well, then what do you do with it? So, okay, let's jump in. If there's anybody got questions, maybe we'll take a few minutes. Um, if anybody needs to jump off, go ahead. But I'd like to open it up. Any questions, um, just unmute and jump in with a question or you can type it in or raise, you know, raise your virtual hand. Um, go ahead. Hello. Yep, Hanin, go ahead. Yeah, I just maybe want to say a comment. I always believe that genomics is the basis to improve crops or to domesticate crops because with the idea maybe we could actually, for example, first start with genomics, genome sequencing of wild crops and then look at these genes and so on and then improve this crop or domesticate this crop. But in this case, for example, there is no genomics. It's really just breeding like you cross and then you have new crop that is actually domesticated in very um, short time. So what is your comment in this that genomic is the basis to improve um, or have new crops? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, my argument is it's very simple. So part of the story I didn't get to tell. And, you know, I, I like I like the story part because I think it inspires, you know, it's, it's, it's the encouraging part. But I would make the argument, no, there, there was a lot actually. So we did genotype all the founder lines and then we did use machine assisted learning to then tell us what to cross and how to cross it. We would have never gotten to a fully domesticated phase in four years from the onset of creating those. Really, the, the, the breeding, kind of the, the selection work, that was classical. That was the first part just to get to the founders. We needed genomic assisted selection to get us rapidly to the end game to make this happen in a short period of time. The learning, though, that we got beyond this, and, and this is what's really cool, is we learned, actually, we know pretty much how this happened, like, um, and really what so what we learned, not, not about the, so the domestication is not the, the cool part. That's a small amount of genes. Corn shows us that it's all right. And we did the alignment, but what was really cool is what we learned was, is why did we lose protein content whenever we brought in genes from common oat? Okay. Why did so many researchers using classical breeding techniques fail, not fail, but didn't get the protein and the macronutrients to come through, right? when they brought in genes from domesticated oat, right? Here's the answer, what we've learned from you having genomics, right? If you would have had genomics, you would have said, don't do that. <laughs> like, like I didn't do it because of what everybody else was seeing. I said, well, we, we, we just have to do it this way because that way's not working. I, I guess I'm foolish or stupid in that regard. When we're able to look at it backwards with genomics, we found out that the grain protein content transcription factor was the key. Literally. So what happened was in domestication of the other oats, the common oat, a grain farmer some time ago found a note that was plumper. Well, that was a deletion in the grain protein content transcription factor. That transcription factor we now know was unlocking 50 different types of genes. So that key worked on all those genes to upregulate all those genes. Well, if you mutate this key out, what happens over thousands of years to those other genes. There's no, there's no selection pressure to maintain those keyholes, right? So when you go to bring the grain transcription, that, that transcription factor back in to CRISPR-Cas9 or something else, guess what? It doesn't work on all those genes anymore because all those locks have changed. So now I'm going to have to revert those locks all the way back to where they began thousands of years ago and put that single selection pressure back on all those locks because those locks were unlocking the mobilization of all the amino acids and all these minerals and everything from the leaves to the seed. Whenever you deleted it and why they got a plumper seed was is because now I catabolize all that, turn it into sugar and move it to the seed. And what does the seed do? It's got to go fast, right? Creates a lot of starch. So we got a lot of starch in place of a lot of nutrients. In this case, we just maintain the key because it maintained the selection pressure, which then allowed us to have all the macronutrient density and then we just change the domestication genes. So from my lessons to you is you can use all the cool genomics tools now to rapidly domesticate any crop. And I've said this to Jesse, CRISPR-Cas9 in genome editing, just delete all these genes, create recessive mutations in all these genes and domesticate any crop you want on the planet, right? Like that's where I'm like, dude, Jesse, we totally need to take Atroplex and just make it non-bitter 
and make it annual. And then we can then fix all the things wrong with it and we can grow it on the ocean. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. So yes, you're dead on. You could do everything I did even faster now, right? Yeah, um, so genomics still is the basic to improve probes. <laughs> you're totally right. Yeah, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the, the, the book that tells us how to do everything, right? We just got it now that we can read it. Yeah, I, I'm still partially old school, so you're you're the real hope for the the future, right? Not me. <laughs> so, thanks, Annie. Thank question. you. Any other question from anyone? We'll take one more. Maybe anyone. No other questions. I'm curious, though, Eric. Too okay. Related to that. We take all the known genes and mutate them. How, how many other unknown genes do you think you mutated and picked up in this whole process too? Because yeah. we're, we're, we, I mean, we'll, we'll talk, uh, this is a prelude for everyone next week. Um, the story is similar, but not so simple in uh, intermediate wheatgrass. And, yeah. and so I think there's these major ones that are obvious targets Right, that right? you most of the way there, but then there's a lot of minor additional yeah. alleles and modifiers that through this breeding, right, mm -hmm. you don't have the you don't have the genomic information ahead of time, but through this breeding, you slowly build those up also. So yeah, Jesse, there's um, as we talk about the paper, um, there's a even in just so you think about like we started with those founders and we did all the recombination events and we had 41 lines in Morocco that we talk about Tam's paper and you could see there's a lot of variation within that right um, so there's a substantial amount of other mutations that we don't know about so yeah the yeah. to your point last night Jesse I mean the holy grail would be to sequence all these lines and then answer that question um, and and get an understanding of all the other changes that occurred yeah. um, again. But Jorge Dukoski and I talked about this. You know, he did the study on this, which I thought was really cool. If you induce mutations on lines, you can create almost more genetic variation that exists in common wheat today. And him doing that through mutations. So it's like, that's a super awesome, like, opportunity space, right? Like, as geneticists, we want as much variation as possible. And then we want to, like, guide it, right? That's, that, that's also the, the hope of genomics, right? Start as wide as possible and then move it where you want it to go. That's exactly. Okay. Very cool. Thanks. Okay. I think we'll adjourn there for the for the seminar. Everybody, I uh, we stay on this we stay on this line. Uh, maybe we'll take like a five minute break here. Everybody, um, and then we'll uh, jump back on with Eric and have some time. Uh, everybody that's that's um, staying for the journal club have some time to discuss his paper. I sent the patent around to those that were signed up for the club. You've heard the talk today, so we'll have all kinds of stuff to talk about. And you can talk about the philosophy of doing science, right? So, okay, five minute break, everybody. Let's reconvene here uh, shortly and then we'll have some great discussion time. So thanks again, everybody for joining. Thanks, Eric, for being up super early. And um, it's great, great talk. And of course, always great stories. So thanks, man. Okay.